Good morning. Let's do that again. Good morning. Thank you. Right, I thought I'd start with some philosophy. Uh, uh, these words were spoken by uh, one of our great philosophers. Optimists say the future is a place we've never been. Histories say we're doomed to make the same mistakes again. Dear leaders, please do something quick. Time is up, the planet's sick. So who do you trust, your head or heart, when things all seem to fall apart? I guess we'll wake up smarter one fine day. These are the words of the great British philosopher Gordon Thomas Matthew Sumner, better known to many of you as Sting. <laughs> and I was in the gym the other day thinking about how I'd open this conference and his song, One Fine Day, from which those words are taken, came and I thought that's a pretty perfect summation of, of what we're trying to do here today, is to wake up smarter one fine day, and that day hopefully is tomorrow. Um, <laughs> Because the lineup of people we have here for you today will make you smarter, they will challenge you, they will make you think. If you don't wake up smarter tomorrow, we've done something horribly wrong. Last year, I told you that the world was largely broken and introduced, along with Ollie, a roll call of speakers who were trying to fix that broken world. I told you that democracy was in crisis, hopelessly incapable of dealing with the complex problems of the day, it no longer democratizes health, wealth, education, opportunity. Um, and what has the party political response been? Simply to double down on extreme positions to either to the left or to the right and uh, no, to hell with the consequences. Our national democracy, party politics, has in fact become a national mental illness which makes a mockery of all of us, including, it turns out, the Queen. Looking at Parliament last week, could any of us see any bipartisanship or empathy or collaboration? And so we've become ever more divided, both here and in America, and we have this total collapse in the trusts and the institutions that shape society here and across the Western world, and, and with good reason. In 1919, W.B. Yeats wrote a very famous poem, The Second Coming, and I want to quote the lines from it because I think they're prescient. Things fall apart, the centre cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The ceremony of innocence is drowned, the best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. It feels pretty prescient, doesn't it? It feels like it could have been written today. I wonder what an alien looking outside at our democracies and the way we govern ourselves would think from their neutral viewpoint. What would their conclusion be? Probably something a bit like this, I would imagine. And so we're lucky, as I say, in our first session to have some people who are going to talk to us about democracy, what's wrong with it, and maybe what can be fixed. So the wonderful David Runciman, who's Head of Politics and International Studies at Cambridge, is going to talk about our increasing divisions, and particularly uh, those to do with generational division uh, and what we can do about that. But then what about democracy's inability to deal with the digital age? Again, I'm going to go to the past, and I'm going to quote this man. And I'm going to quote from page 25 of this book, The Demon Haunted World, which was written in 1995. Now, if I can find the parts, here we go. Listen to this. I have a foreboding of a world in my children's time when awesome technological powers are in the hands of a very few. No one representing the public interest can grasp the issues when the people have lost ability to set their own agendas or knowledgeably question those in authority. With our critical faculties in decline, we are unable to distinguish between what feels good and what is true. We slide, almost without noticing, back into superstition and darkness. Again, another prescient prediction from 24 years ago. And we've learned, haven't we, from the Cambridge Analytica scandal, just how prescient that prediction was. Now, our prejudices used to be sold too, in that you buy a newspaper that largely agreed with you. Now our prejudices are for sale weaponized by social media, so that it becomes ever more difficult for us to cooperate. And that scandal was, of course, exposed by the wonderful Carol Cadwallader, who's here to tell us about how we got here, and hopefully a little bit about what can be done. That the world is divided is probably no surprise, given that we humans are divided in ourselves. Whether it's conservative thinkers like Jordan Peterson, who talks about the division between order and chaos that we have to walk, or more conservative psychologists, uh, sorry, uh, liberal psychologists like Jonathan Hyde, who talks about emotion and rationality and how we have to battle with those two things. He describes that sort of battle in our heads as a bit like a rider on the back of an elephant. The rider is the rational brain, the elephant is the much more difficult to control emotional brain. We are indeed beset by contradictions as human beings. And indeed, I like to say that if you want to find the nearest crazy person, look in the mirror. The battle of being is actually learning how to manage these contradictions in the service of a better world. Better world. Mental health is a lifelong uh, journey, but it will become impossible if the machinery of the brain is sick. And so our second session today, we will be looking at that. So 
um, Siddhartha and Chandran will be looking at regenerative neurology, uh, neurology and he's asking, can the brain fix itself? Uh, Maxine will talk to us about how we can predict things like dementia 20 years in advance. And then uh, Tim will talk about our second brain, the brain of our gut, the trillions of microbes that we have to have a good relationship with in order to keep ourselves fit and healthy. And keep ourselves fit and healthy we must, because all of us in this room have a bit of a task on our hands, which is to save the world. <laughs> um, all of us have to do it. We've got uh, 20 years to move our economies off fossil fuels and the damage they've done, and indeed repair that damage. The very existence of our race depends upon it. Um, the headlines are coming thick and fast. Last year I quoted this chap, Johan Rockström. He said, you may have noticed the environment is starting to send back invoices. Well, I just want to show you one invoice from the last time I stood on this stage. It was from uh, Hurricane Florence. $17 billion was the cleanup bill of one hurricane alone. We've got less than 60 harvests left at current levels of soil erosion. 50% of the world's population live under water stress. By the policies of our world's national governments, we're heading for a pretty much a four-degree world. That is the end of civilization, as we know. Nothing we do makes any sense if this happens. This is national policy of our world's governments at the moment. And even if we stop emitting carbon tomorrow morning by some magical feat of engineering, we've still got at least two meters of sea level rise baked into the system we can do nothing about. This is a thermodynamic problem. 90% of the heat from climate change has gone into the water, and that water is still too hot, and it's still lapping up against the ice sheets. So don't invest in beachfront property. And if you live in East Anglia, Maybe time to look at right move. <laughs> this should terrify you. This is a methane hole, one of many, currently being blasted in the Siberian, the Siberian permafrost, or what's left of it. The permafrost is melting, and now methane is leaking out, busting up. Uh, and the locals are finding at the military saying, please stop dropping bombs on this. Actually, it's not what's happening. The permafrost is melting. This picture, uh, you can see all of those dots are craters underneath of one lake in Siberia. And as you probably know, methane is 33 times more dangerous than CO2. Our response is pretty poor. So this is the government's own advisors saying we're going to have water shortages because of climate change within a generation here. Uh, the money we've put aside and the planning we do for our flood defences, we already know is completely inadequate for what we absolutely already know is going to happen to us in terms of sea level rise. And uh, the UK's government's response to climate change is a bit like Dad's Army. That's the Commission for Climate Change, the government's own advisers telling the government they're a bit like Dad's Army. It's not just government advisers, it's not environmentalists, it's not just scientists saying this stuff, it's the world's biggest asset managers. The England General saying, looking at the way we invest, we are headed for a climate catastrophe. So I'm going to ask you a question, it's an interactive moment. Uh, I'm going to ask you two questions. I want you to put your hand up if you answer um, uh, yes to the first one, and then you're going to keep your hands up. Some of you will keep your hands up when I ask the second one, some of you will put them down. So the first question is, uh, put your hand up if you care about the future and the environment. Great, okay, keep your hands up. Now, I'm going to ask you a second question. Keep your hand up if the organisation that you represent here today is carbon neutral. Interesting. What is it about that journey from home to work, which means you stop forgetting, stop thinking about the future or caring about the world? There are rays of help. Um, you know, uh, wind is now getting ridiculously cheap. Uh, even BP have admitted that by 2040, renewables will be the world's biggest energy source. This is uh, you know, particularly interesting from BP because they've been getting their predictions on renewables wrong for like decades because it doesn't really fit in with their business model. Um, look at this. This is, this is the Central Street in Georgetown, Central Texas. Uh, 65,000 Trump voters don't care about climate change. The whole town moved over to renewables last year for electricity. And 15 towns in central Texas are now following their example uh, because it's now cheaper to use wind and solar in central Texas than it is to use oil when you're right next to the oil field, which is pretty cool, isn't it? So when that sort of thing starts happening, you maybe, maybe we might just have a, a, a roadmap out of this. But uh, Dale Ross, the mayor of the town, told me, he said, uh, even if renewables were slightly more expensive, I'd still use them which is an interesting point of view for a fiscally conservative man like Dale. And uh, why is that? Well, because it solves this problem. This is the oil price. It's pretty volatile. We've seen what's happened this week. Oil price has gone up 20% this week. Let me ask you a question. What do you think happened to the cost of sunshine yesterday? So there are some ways out of this, potentially, but time is running out. We have very little time left. And so it is... Wonderful that we have here today some of the people at the forefront of dealing with this grand challenge. And one of my personal heroes, James Thornton, who runs the charity and the law firm Client Earth, which is using existing environmental and business law.
to take corporations and governments to court in the service of saving our future. Then we have Law Kukuron, who's going to talk to us about how, how we move away from our disposable culture to a more circular economy. And then another hero of mine, Gail Bradbrook, the founder of Extinction Rebellion, who's going to tell us how they've achieved so much in getting climate change up the agenda, how they've done that, and what they've got planned next. Now, you know the world is changing, I think, when you get your copy of the Financial Times, as I did last week. And the cover, the cover is this. Capitalism, time for a reset. <laughs> okay, this is, not, this is quite a surprising, I think, uh, headline for the Financial Times. And so we've got a bunch of uh, economists to come and talk to us about how do we create an economy that moves us away from destroying life to sustaining it. So we'll have Giulio Boccoletti. If Giulio's here. I'd like you to explain to us what exactly you are doing in that picture, Giulio. Um, but he's going to talk about how we move our economy to think about our scarce resources uh, with the right value. And he's going to look at that through the lens of fresh water. Then my good friend Kate Rayworth, perhaps the most important econom economist of our age. She's found an, an economic model that allows all of us to talk to each other, whether we're environmentalists or business people or policymakers, such that we can meet the needs of the human being, but also keep us within the bounds of the planetary boundaries that we must not break. Um, so I'm very much looking forward to that. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about systems change because that's what I do and that's what I write about. And one of the things I find is that sustainable systems change, which is what we're talking about today, usually comes from what I call bottom-up diverse collaboration. It, it usually sustains and lasts because it's come from the people themselves. And usually they're doing something that was previously done to them. And they're able to do that now because they've been democratized by a new technology or a new uh, way of uh, working together or a new financial instrument or a new business model. And they're doing it in the form of a social contract. They're not doing it to make more money. They just want cleaner air, better education, whatever. Okay, whether it's crowdsourced versions of coming up with new drugs in India or patients' na networks coming together to improve their own healthcare or community energy or uh, agroecological processes that move uh, 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 farmers from subsistence to profit without any expensive inputs or GMOs, whether it's urban farming rebooting Detroit, whether it's participatory budgeting where cities turn around to their, their, their customers, uh, their, their, um, citizens and say, how would you like to spend your own taxes? Even if it's blockchain, which is a distributed way of replacing trusted third parties with a technology, a distributed version of trust. Bottom-up diverse collaboration seems to win time and time and time again. And the question is why? Well, there's some very technical reasons why that happens. The more diverse an audience that's involved in looking at a problem, the better the, the kind of uh, the soil, that, I suppose, of all those views coming together. So you get a better sort of uh, growth of ideas. But there's a more fundamental reason, and it's something I use a lot in my work. And I think the reason it works is because it's how human beings actually work and build trust. I talk a lot in my work about the trust ladder. So how do we build trust? First, we share stories. You go to a party, you don't know somebody, you do small talk. What you're actually doing there is making sure that the person opposite you is not trying to kill you or, or steal your money. Basically, that's what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and when you got to that point, you go, okay, well, this is okay. They're definitely not trying to kill me. I might start to share some actual information. Things are actually true about me. This happens with individuals. It happens with organizations. It happens with governments. Information sharing is the next level of trust. The next level of trust is asset sharing. Okay, now I'm willing to share things of actual value with you. Yes, you can borrow my lawnmower. You can babysit my kids if you think of your kids as an asset. But you know what I mean? Things of actual value are now, uh, are now available to be shared. And you'll know this from your own businesses. Departments that share assets generally collaborate better than those that stick in their little silos. And then after that, we get to the next level, which is to actually deciding to do projects together. So uh, in my community, for instance, we decided we needed to build a community cafe. So we did. Organizations where departments collaborate on projects generally work better than those that don't. And finally, the next level of trust is we get to the top of that and we go, you know, after doing all those projects, um, we've decided we want to change the rules of the game. Um, now, what you're looking at there is increasing levels of collaboration, but you're also looking at increasing levels of trust and socialization. People are getting more and more socialized. Their politics no longer divides them because they have projects to work on. And what's interesting about that is that the biggest indicator of whether you live a long and happy life it's not whether you quit smoking or quit drinking or do more exercise. All those things are important. I'm not suggesting you don't. But the biggest indicator, and these are the bars at the top of this graph, the biggest indicator of whether you will live a long and happy life is how socialized you are. Not just your close personal relationships, but also the, the relationships with the people around you, in your community, in your business community, wherever. How do you know them? Do you like them? Do you trust them? Do you get on? Do you share stuff? So but diverse bottom-up collaboration isn't just a thing it wins. It is essential for human happiness. And what is wrong with the world? is this. 
Usually somebody decides the priorities at the top, they decide which projects do need to be done, then they decide which assets need to be corralled, then they decide which information needs to be shared, and finally they'll sell it to the employees or the voters or the consumer. And unless you've got to an asset sharing level of a community, no amount of leadership will work. And yet social policy in the UK and indeed across the Western world seems to be all about destroying social cohesion, which makes us leaderless and open to conspiracy theory. This is why Extinction Rebellion have done so much better than Friends of the Earth in such a short period of time, because they understand this. And I said it with a lot of respect for Friends of the Earth, Jonathan Porritt, who set it up as a friend of mine. So how do you get up that lift? How do you get up that ladder? Lots of ways of doing it. One of my favorite ways of doing it is what I call the participation virus, where you make the thing you want people to do, the replicating of that, actually its own reward. You make the thing you want people to do, you make the next step they have to do enjoyable in and of itself. And the best example of this is, of course, uh, sex. So, uh, this book is called The Joy of Sex, Not the Horrible Nightmare of Having Sex for a Reason, because Mother Nature very sensibly decided that uh, we would make, it would make sex, for most of us, most of the time, you know, an enjoyable thing to do, and therefore the species is propagated. I like to joke that uh, if having sex was like eating a wasp, this audience would be a lot smaller. So, uh, consumerism did the same thing. Consumerism tells us that shopping itself is an enjoyable thing to do. So the act of replication becomes something enjoyable and keeps the engine going. And we need to make the green future, the sustainable future, a participation virus through collaboration. We need to get us all to here. So the job is for us all to start collaborating on the big project, which is saving the Earth. And it doesn't just mean collaborating within your organisation, it means collaborating across organisations, which is why all of you in this room at the same time, with Weatherby's Bank underneath you all, is important. Because unless you all start collaborating on this big issue, we're all dead. And that's the big picture. And I thought I'd end with the big picture. Here it is. This is the big picture. Some of you may recognize it. It was taken in 1990 on Valentine's Day. It's taken by Voyager, the space probe as it exited the solar system. And that pale blue dot there is the Earth. And it gave rise to a very famous speech by um, Carl Sagan. And I'd like to read you a little bit from that speech now. The Earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilt by all those generals and emperors so that they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. The Earth is the only world we know to harbor life. Like it or not, this is where we make our stand. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. It underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we have ever known. This is the job of the next 10 years. And if we don't do it, nothing else we do matters. Now, why are these people here today? Because they didn't get paid much, I can tell you. We all got paid the same, there's not very much. Okay. Why are these people here, this extraordinary role caller, some of the world's best thinkers, taking time out of their calling, their job, to do the amazing work they do? Why would James Thornton from Client Earth give up time to be here? Why would any of them do that? They've got work to do. They're doing it, I think, because of an equation that I use a lot in my systems change work, which is this, legitimacy plus capability equals action. Lots of people have legitimate concerns, they can't do anything about it. Lots of people have capability, but they have no legitimacy. Now, our speakers have a lot of this, and they have some of that, but you, you have a lot of that. Sorry, a little of that and a lot of this. That is why they are here. They know that in this room there are the wealthy, the entrepreneurial, the connected, and they know that without your help, we cannot do this. You bring capability to their legitimacy. Dear leaders, please do something quick. Time is up. The planet's sick. I'm going to end again with another bit of history as we go into the future, which is from Abraham Lincoln. He gave an address in 1862 to Congress. The USA, what we now know as the USA, was in the middle of a civil war. And he said these words. The dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. The occasion is piled high with difficulty, and we must rise to the occasion. As our case is new, so we must think anew and act anew. We must disenthrall ourselves, and then we shall save our country. Today, 
It's not about disenthralling ourselves to save our country. It's about disenthralling ourselves to save ourselves. Let's see what can be done. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark, for that absolute tour de force. Such a good backdrop for the day. Thank you. Um, somebody has come through on uh, Glissa, not with a question, but it is a provocation. Mark mentioned, if only we had a miraculous technology to turn things around. Trees are that technology. Uh, yes. <laughs> and then, and then, and then. Uh, but uh, it's absolutely true. Uh, are we planting enough? No, it's really interesting, actually. When it, there, are, there are a number of what they call natural solutions to climate change, which are about you know, rebalancing the carbon cycle. If you look at the money that goes into research and stuff, only 2% of it goes into natural solutions. So it, you know, it's not that we don't have the technology or the intelligence to do it. What we don't do is organise ourselves properly. Right. Uh, so now, on uh, that, yes and no. On that unsettling number of people that put their hands down to your carbon neutral question, yes. someone's going to go back to their workplace tomorrow. Yes. Other than saying this is now on the table, practical steps just to be going into our minds. Okay, well, the first we thing you do is, is you need to work out how much you're emitting. And there are a number of excellent consultants who can help you do that. And they'll talk about your scope one, two, and three emissions the things you emit directly, the things you emit because you buy them, and stuff in your supply chain. So you need to know what that is. Yeah. You need to be honest about so that. Get the baseline. So get the baseline, otherwise, you're, you're, not, you're not doing anything. Then you have to reduce those emissions as much as possible. And there are many ways to do that. And actually, that actually improves your bottom line because the, more, the less you're wasting, the less you're you know, throwing anything out. So actually, it generally returns that you're using less water, you're using mm -hmm, less mm -hmm. fuel. It's actually good for your bottom line anyway. Um, and then you have to responsibly offset what's left. And that means offsetting stuff by planting trees, for instance, in a way that is additional. So it's not already trees that are just going to be protected that are already there. It's planting additional trees. And that uh, additional offsetting has to be audited by a third party. So there's something called the gold standard for offsetting, which is what you should be using. So those are the three things. But the, 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 but the game at hand is to move our money and our investments away from an economy that destroys our future to one that moves it. Look at your investments and do a carbon assessment of your investments. And if you are committing carbon crimes in your investments, then you need to divest quickly. Otherwise, we'll come after you with pitchforks quite soon. Got it. Well, noted. Well, uh, thank you, Mark, for staying with us all day, uh, but also for getting us off to a rip-roaring start. Ladies and gents, Mark Stevenson. Thanks. Thank you, Mark.